Welcome to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Michelle Berquist, your host today, but we have some very timely information we're getting ready to talk about because we have not one, but two subject matter smarty pants. Other people call them subject matter experts. We have smarty pants that are on today with our online forum. And just a little bit of logistics, our online forums last for an hour. If you've joined with video, it's like you're going to be able to see both of our subject matter experts and me as well. Um, you know, we want you to do questions. We want you to chat with us. There's a chat box feature that you can post a question privately if you'd like to ask our subject matter experts or if you'd like to, you know, be open and ask the questions as we get into this conversational style and discussion. But our topic today is a timely one with everything going on in the world right now. Everyone in the world is asking the question, but specifically for us in California, we're asking the question, it's like, what do we do about lack of money, money, managing our money better? And obviously our homes and mortgages are a piece of that. So today's topic is what's really happening with refinancing right now. And I'm delighted to introduce both of our subject matter experts and smarty pants. Um, these are two people that have been in the business a long time, but I'm going to go with ladies first, John. I'm just letting you know. And our first subject matter expert and leading lady today is Rebecca Ross, and she's the president of Elite Lending um, and also a branch manager at Finance of America, not just in California, but in Hawaii as well, which I think right now, Rebecca, all of us want to go to Hawaii. I think that's, you know, just where we'd want to be with what's going on. And our second subject matter expert is John Burroughs. And John is a senior mortgage consultant who's been in the business, I believe, 30 plus years. I'm going to ask both of you this question. And John is with Finance of America. So two of you, um, welcome to our online forum. And what is really going on with refinancing is my big question. I'm going to let Rebecca take the lead on the Peter's Digest version before we dive into the stuff. What's going on with refinancing, Rebecca? Thank you, Michelle. Um, well, it's pretty active right now. Um, about two weeks ago, the rates dropped pretty dramatically and a lot of business flooded the market. And this was, a, I mean, COVID-19 was just starting, but it wasn't, we weren't on quarantine yet. Um, and then I will say that our world isn't very normal right now and the financial markets are not following any norms either. So what typically happens is when you have uh, the stock market going down, like it did, typically those funds uh, flow into the bond market, which is what uh, regulates the mortgage interest rates. So typically money will go from the stock market to the bond market and rates will drop when the stock market goes down. That's not what happened um, about a week and a half ago. The opposite happened and from what I understand, the reasoning is because um, the people that would normally take the money and put it into the bond market were having margin calls on their stock. So they were having to sell bonds instead of buy bonds. So we had a stock market going down and interest rates going up. Then you add into it um, Mnuchin saying that we might look at a 20% unemployment rate. And just to give you some idea of what that means, in the last crisis in 08, 09, we had a 10% unemployment. Wow. And in the Great Depression, we had 25%. So um, that was a big shock to the markets because then the mortgage investors are saying, wait a minute, we have to factor in risk because we're going to be looking potentially at a lot of foreclosures. So all those pieces to the puzzle made the interest rates skyrocket um, right after they hit a, a very low mark. Um, and so we're having days where we have to watch it like a hawk. So I had clients I had locked in, they were protected with the lower rates, but then I had a few that had drugged their feet, weren't quite ready, and when they got ready, missed the boat. So we just have to, we're watching the market. I know John is as well for his clients. We're watching the market um, multiple times a day because normally we get our interest rates in the morning and they're good for most of the day, all day. Um, that's not what's happening here. We'll have midday price changes up and down in one day. So oh, I, didn't know um, I would suggest that if you are looking to refinance, you definitely want to work with someone who's 
on, on top of the market because that's really what it takes right now. So let, can we dig in? I mean, again, I'm going to free fall some of these questions, but, you know, I know there's so many of our members and our association, right? And just, you know, women and men, of course, but everybody's asking the question right now. We're all still a little bit in a state of shock and awe, but based on what you know right now, Rebecca or John, like what would you recommend people do right now if they own a home? You know, if they're looking to conserve cash or should they refinance, what, what's today look like for somebody in refinancing or mortgage lending? Well, John and I were just actually talking about this a few minutes ago. Um, things are changing in that maybe people initially were wanting to lower their payment and just, you know, refinance what they owed on the property. But now the goals may change. Um, it may be a time to look at consolidating debt. Because if you can pay off your credit card debt that you're paying 10 to 20 percent uh, interest on, um, consolidate that into a mortgage payment with a, a low, much lower interest rate over 30 years. You're going to help your cash flow. That right now is what most people are thinking about is cash flow. Uh, put some money in your pocket, pay off debt, um, and be able to ride this one out. You know, it's interesting because I already know right now, and I'd love to lob some questions at you of scenarios that I already know of some of our members and just see what your take might be. And again, I just want to make sure for disclosure on anybody that watches this show, um, post show, post today, is that things could change. I mean, we're that fluid right now from what I heard you say, Rebecca, that we, this is a day to day kind of thing. But John, here's a question for somebody that I, you know, I just spoke to. We've got a member. I know that recently her husband was laid off um, as of last month, not with the coronavirus, right? But he was laid off. Now she's been impacted as a small business who's a solopreneur and they own a home, they have equity. I mean, in a scenario like that, can you even do anything because they can't show income? And it's like, are they dead in the water or are there things that might be able to be done? Well, unfortunately, my answer there is uh, the number one criteria for anybody making a loan. There's three big um, parts of that puzzle. It's income, assets, and credit, but the income is showing the ability to repay, and without the ability to repay, no lender is going to go out there and make a loan on a property that they don't anticipate is going to get paid back in a timely fashion. So unfortunately, a short of private money loans, which I don't recommend unless it's a last-minute urgency, or an emergency for that matter, that they go that route. Because being able to even make those short-term loans, which most private money is, if this protracts itself out for a long period of time, they may find themselves painted into a corner again. So that's unfortunately uh, for them and other folks like them is going to be pretty much the rule. Because as Rebecca mentioned just a little while ago, we're watching regulations and guidelines changing. And when you said on a day-to-day -day basis, this is a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Wow. Either one of us has ever seen anything like this in the history of our career. I'm going on 37 years in lending and never, and I do mean never, have we encountered anything of this nature. Um, and also, and I'll get into this a little bit uh, deeper here further in the show, but one of the other things to stress upon people is if you are in a position to do something for yourself to improve the cash flow, make your situation better, hunker down and plan ahead. If you have that ability to do so, do it sooner than later. We're getting these wild gyrations in interest rates and what I'm doing with all my clients like Rebecca's that missed the boat and drug their feet. Well, I'm telling them now the person who gets the most attention from me is the one that cooperates to the fullest. We ask for things, get them to us. I'm pushing all my clients to the point of getting their loans approved and then just sit and wait if we have to. If the approvals are good for a 90 day period of time and if we have to, we'll start all over again. But long story short, be cooperative, get what people need, get to the, your lender what they need so that they're in a position to help you and then clearly define what your goals are is once things start to swing wildly, and if it's for the better, I don't have time personally to call every person and bounce it off of them again. I need to act and I need to act immediately. So if we have written defined goals, and you've given me carte blanche authority to be able to lock that loan when the opportunity strikes, that's what I'm going to do. 
So be smart about it and open communication is critical. Yeah, I think be proactive. Right, well, think proactive. about it this way. Rebecca and I both probably, it's like with, with what happened overnight when the rates drop, and I know she'll back me up on this, it's like somebody walking up to you about four o'clock in the afternoon, dumping a month's worth of work in your lap and say, have that done by tomorrow morning. Yeah. You know, I love that. Well, you know, I, I, this is what I'm, you know, again, I just want to look at the realness of right now is that people, I think so many, and I'll say women, you know, we don't know what we don't know about mortgages and what I re remember and recall from refinancing and buying, it's not a short process. So, you know, what would you two recommend in relation to refinancing? And I, I know you guys are on it if people are responsive, and that was a great suggestion. But there are people right now that their income has been impacted. Like I know another member, and she's in the health space, right? And she's um, a physical therapist. She has had an impact to her income because seniors are stay at home. She can't go visit her, her patients, her clients, because you know, right now it's like everything's on lockdown, but owns a home, has equity in the home, has decent credit. You know, that that's a challenge as well, because now her income shows less than what it would have three months ago. Are the mortgage lenders making any sort of consideration on something like that for people that have had a drop in their income as a result of the coronavirus? Rebecca? That, that's a good, a good question, Michelle. Um, so far, I haven't seen a blanket response. Um, to the lending industry. I know that some lenders, I know Bank of America, there were a couple um, banks in Hawaii, Bank of Hawaii, First Wine Bank, that are um, allowing for forbearance or deferment. Deferment is preferred because then it's just basically adding those ones that you miss onto the end of your mortgage. Right. Um, and they are not gonna be reporting it um, onto your credit as a, as a late. Um, so that would be something that they could each uh, call their lender. If, you, if you're not eligible for a refinance right now because of what you described, I would say first a phone call to your lender to ask what they're um, able to do right now. And then the other thing, because we have a lot of uh, self-employed um, members with CWI, um, I understand that SBA is offering um, uh, some loans for self-employed uh, for COVID-19, I think the interest rate I was told was 3.75. Um, I don't know the other terms of it, but it would be worth um, exploring. And I can add a few of those. I mean, we've had some members that have applied for that, you know, that their business was impacted that fast. And, you know, as an association, us too, you know, we're right in there. But, you know, when you go to the SBA website right now, some of the pages that were live are now under maintenance. It's ridiculous, but I understand. Oh you know, on top of that, it's like it's a 30 year loan. And it is, you're right, anywhere between one and 1.75 to 3.75. Long term, very long term, 30 years is huge for an SBA loan for a disaster assistance loan. Um, the challenge is the paperwork is ridiculous. I mean, it's like, you know, same kind of thing of looking for a mortgage, right? When you first buy a home and all the paperwork that's there. So it's, it's not for the faint of heart, let me say that. And then, you know, the timing of it, it's not quick and fast. And, you know, I know another, you know, um, business that they were, they're a salon and, you know, obviously they had to close their doors and it's indefinite, you know, when those businesses rely on clients, you know, every single month. And right now, they have employees that are part, con some of them contractors, some of them employees. What could maybe an employer do for their employees as far as mortgages or refinancing right now? Any thoughts on that of what an employer can do to kind of like help their employees? Well, I heard a, um, a report on my drive in to work this morning, um, suggestions for people in the food industry. A lot of the restaurants, of course, we all know how that went the last two weeks. A lot of the larger food providers and restaurants, of course, trying to keep the doors open, doing the carry out or the, the uh, pickup uh, type of trade. And they're saying that's the best way they know how to keep at least kitchen staff and such busy, keeping the kitchen open. So they've turned to those types of efforts to at least keep the core group, uh, at least some cash flow going. Uh, that's one suggestion I saw. Um, and of course, you know, that is not going to apply for all the industries here, too. My biggest curiosity I have right now is what's going to be 
um, the government's response to this. I'm certainly not going to get political about this at all. However, uh, Congress um, spent until well after midnight last night, and my understanding is this bill is going to vote to get some relief for individuals and corporations and healthcare and all different sectors of the market where they've been hit the hardest. So I'm real anxious to see how that's going to go. Um, and Rebecca, I mean, I don't know what you've heard on the street, but those are the, the nuts and bolts of it. And unfortunately, we're all in this thing in a very difficult time together. And uh, I just hope and pray that we get, get out of it sooner than the impact indicates at this point in time. You know, I just want to thank you guys, because I, I know, you know, you're not in the business of, you know, quick and fast loans, right? I mean, that's not your business. Your business is mortgage lending. And, you know, until things happen like this, none of us really think about, you know, what would we do? I mean, who would ever think that we're in this situation? But for right now, the right borrower, let you guys tell me, as of today, who is an ideal candidate for refinancing? Obviously, they have to have income coming in. I got that one from you. But based on a scenario today of what you think is the best for refinancing and where they can benefit. I loved what you said, Rebecca, about somebody that maybe wants some cash out, pay off a credit card debt or something like that. But what are some other scenarios that make it a good scenario right now for someone to refinance? Well, now actually is a really good time because people still have equity in their home and hopefully that will continue to be the case. I mean, I think when we come out of this, we're still going to have a housing shortage. So I'm not overly concerned that the price, the housing market's going to collapse, but um, I think, you know, it might take a short-term hit. People can't even go out and view properties to buy them right now. Uh, California Association of Realtors said no more showing properties. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that. So oh gosh. Uh, if you have equity, now is a, a, a good time. If you have employment, you have equity, um, particularly if you have debt or if you want to maybe pad your pockets with some cash um, to ride whatever this is out for a while. That now would be a good time. And isn't it yeah. interesting, oh, go ahead, John. No, well, one of the things when you said about ideal clients, and I'm blessed, I'm a little old than everybody on the call, but uh, I'm blessed with a lot of senior clients. And of course, people with retirement and social security or pensions, or you know, they're drawing down from pension funds, 401ks, et cetera, et cetera. Those type of folks um, tend to be more rock solid. Uh, also, I have a lot of clients that fall into the critical, you know, essential needs categories, people in healthcare, um, school teachers, all the teacher friends I have right now are teaching from home, so they're still getting paid. So, you know, there's another one that's uh, pretty solid for at least right now. Uh, profiles, of course, first responders, you know, right there at the leading edge. So ideal individuals are one that, or, or if they're working for a government entity, so that you know that, you know, those checks aren't going to stop uh, presumably anytime soon. So I think that's the ideal client, but Rebecca hit the nail on the head. I think the equity position people have will remain strong. And if you can endeavor to keep your credit uh, good, by the way, I have to share something not directly related to this, but I was just paying bills myself yesterday. And out of just sheer curiosity, I called uh, a couple of my business credit card company and a few others uh, just to check and see what the situation was. And I had three or four right up front offers to say, hey, if you're just you know, experiencing some difficult financially, we're not going to ding your credit. We're going to waive your monthly payments for the next month or two. And uh, no late charges, no additional interest. So I was really surprised. They volunteered it. And wow. I didn't have to ask. I just did that out of curiosity. So uh, that's a good thing to share right now. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I think that's what's so so troubling is that it's the unsureness of what's going on. And, you know, I was talking to somebody else that's a member of the other, I think it was Monday, and we were kind of talking about strategies because, you know, obviously income's been impacted if you run a business, but you know, would you advise, even if somebody is employed right now, like we don't know how this is going to flush out. Would you, would you recommend or not recommend that somebody call you? And even if they're in a scenario right now that income is okay, but we don't know what's going to happen. Like, would you recommend somebody refinance just as a in case kind of scenario? I mean, we, I remember 2008 and, you know, real estate was going to be the same way it was forever. And then 
everything kind of crumbled, but would you recommend just as a plan B that somebody go ahead and refinance? Is that to their benefit? And if so, you know, I think everyone's uh, situation is unique. You know, I, I'm John and I both and sure uh, we, I sit down and look at what is their current interest rate that they're, that they have, how much do they owe? Um, and really look at the, the benefits. Uh, do they have extra cash? You know, do they have a slush fund if they need it? I mean, I think you're looking at the whole picture and, you know, I really sit down with my clients and have these conversations. And I think it depends on what sector um, they're in um, to make kind of, uh, you know, more of an advisory role. I wouldn't say that everybody across the board um, is, is a good, you know, client for refinancing, but I think it's worth the conversations. I love that. Same thing, John? Yeah, pretty much the same thing. We have to examine each and every situation, you know, on its own merit, its own its own value in the property, as Rebecca said, not the reiterate. But would you like some good news along with all of this? Yes, please. I would love some good news. I got jazzed yeah, well, for that. <laughs> I, I am very impressed with a couple of entities out there that really jumped jumped through hoops very quickly to try to make some meaningful changes. One of them was the California Association of Realtors came out with in record time a new addendum to the purchase money contract. So if you're in the middle of a transaction or about to go into a transaction, this addendum accounts for COVID-19 and some of the ramifications of job loss and took away some of the sting or the the edge that you could possibly lose a deposit if something happened to you that you didn't see coming. So it's kind of get out of jail card for anybody involved in the transaction. Now, granted, all parties have to agree to it, but if you're a seller that has to sell, you probably don't want to stop what you're doing and begin the process all over, particularly in this atmosphere. Right. Know that you've got a willing buyer in hand, so just being patient and being calm and kind and keeping a level head will be to your advantage. So that's one thing. The other one is the appraisals on properties. Mm -hmm. With an appraisal, an inspector generally has to go inside the home. And borrowers were not so comfortable with that, uh, as well as appraisers not feeling so comfortable with it. So property inspection waivers, there's been a push to lighten up the rules on that a little bit so that you don't have to do an appraisal at all. Or what happened just yesterday, we finally got some ground on being able to do what we call the old drive-by appraisers. What, what would happen is they don't have to do an exterior inspection, they don't have to go on the property. So appraisers, as long as they can reasonably determine a value of a home without having to go inside, uh, they're gonna opt to go that route on many of the agency type deals. Those are the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans. So we are making some progress to try to lighten up some of the uh, issues that we had percolating under the surface. I'm so happy to have good news. And, and again, you know, just we're, we're trying to be relevant and provide information. I mean, both of you are, you know, so expert in what you do. I mean, I, I'm curious for both of you, like what would be the things that you would converse with somebody? Are you open to any question from someone that owns a home, even if you're not there if, you know, as an example, somebody has a loan with another mortgage company, are you open to having questions just for people to kind of run a scenario by you and see if there's an opportunity for them to refinance or if there's options or do you? I mean, you Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, okay. I actually work with a lot of financial planners that they'll say like, you know, you need to run this by Rebecca. They may already be in the middle of a transaction, you know, with another lender and they'll say like, you need to run this by Rebecca and make sure that it's, you know, a fair deal. And it, assuming it is, and most of the time it is, um, they're, you know, working with reputable people. Um, mm -hmm. And I just give them the, yeah, no, you're good. You know? Um, so I have no problem in assisting folks or even reading through the paperwork, um, you know, their estimates that they're given to make okay. sure that they're getting a fair handshake. Yeah, and I would like to add to that too, is knowing who you're dealing with too in your transaction. If you are involved in another lender, I too have no issues with that. I just think uh, it's a second opinion with anything as, uh, as important as this financing issues, particularly at this point in getting a second opinion is maybe just the thing that helps you sleep at night, like my nephew did with me this morning. Mm -hmm. So that being said, we encourage that. 
Uh, but also, too, knowing some of the key issues. Who are you dealing with in your refinance? Are they a direct lender or are they a broker? And the type of program that you're trying to uh, do on your refinance, because there's many programs that have literally disappeared in the last two, three, or four days. They're just gone from the marketplace. What we call the non-QM or quality mortgage loans. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are essentially out of business or they've just halted entirely. So knowing who the player is that's handling your financing is critical to the equation. You know, how long a lock on a loan are they going to mandate to you? Mm -hmm. uh, our parent corporation, Finance of America, is requiring us all to do 60-day loan locks on all new refinances. So mm -hmm. that thing is that window of time to be able to handle the massive uh, upswing in volume that we're experiencing. And I, we're hoping that as things settle down, it'll slowly but surely and normalize to some degree. But we're all in the dark right now. So, you know, just trying to put the flow every day is a new adventure. That's for sure. I know Becca agrees with me. It totally is. And I got to say, Rebecca, just for you, it's like, I know you were having, you know, looking at something that was off camera here for a second ago, but I'm like, out of full disclosure, you're a mom, you know, you're, you're a professional woman, you're a mortgage lender, you're the president of your own firm. And, you know, you've got kids at home right now and trying to do homeschooling and all of that. Just give us some sense of what it's like to be a mom at home working, you know, having the kids at home and still you know, being in such a busy time right now and unsettling time with the, with the, you know, pandemic. It's crazy. Well, yeah, it, it can be challenging. No, no doubt. Luckily, um, my, I'm used to working from home. I've been working remotely for about 10 years now um, because I oversee the branches in Hawaii and I live in California. So um, I'm kind of used to this and my whole team is used to working remotely. So that's nice. I'm uh, kind of in that groove already, but having the kids kid kids home all day is a whole nother ball of wax. Um, fortunately, uh, one of my children is fully virtual learning. They do Zoom meetings and they're all on schedule and the other two are starting to ramp up. Their schools are ramping up with that. So yeah, it's a new normal. Um, you know, we just got to do what we got to do. I like you saying and that. I think it is. It's a game changer. And John, you're, I mean, what were you going to say? Oh, well, I, I have a child at home, too, and he happens to be 97 years old. <laughs> a whole different side of things, exactly. So, believe me, there's a real parallel there, and I took all I could to finally convince him that uh, you're not going anywhere, sir. Um, you know, I take care of, and I'm the one that's doing all of the out-of-house travel, so I am not, you know, knock on wood, I'm lucky in that I don't have to work from home virtually. Uh, we are an essential part of this whole service, but uh, the service industry, but right here in the office I'm at right now, there we're all separated by a minimum of 10 feet with walls all around us. So I still have the privilege of coming in and using, closing the door to my private office and uh, we distance ourselves. We're ultra consciousness of cleanliness, but still I have to go home at night and talk to this 97-year-old uh, child and say, no, you're not going to the post office and you're not going to the bank and no, you're not going to Costco today. Oh my gosh. That was yesterday's discussion and it got a little tense, but kids are kids. But you handled it well. Yes, like I was saying earlier about uh, one of our employees who has children at home and those are her coworkers. Like yeah. you have, Rebecca, right? Your coworkers you either love them or you, they drive you crazy. I mean, it's <laughs> just a different world right now. You know, I mean, I, this might be interesting for anybody that listens to this afterwards. Um, I'm going to suggest that we have both of you back on again. I think this thing's changed. We want to kind of keep these timely if you're interested. And maybe we invite some other, you know, people in finance that do this because money and how we're going to manage it during this, we don't know what the, you know, depending on how long we're sequestered, I know that's not the right word, but we're at the stay at home mandate. I think, you know, we need to be looking at these things. And what I heard very clearly from both of you is that it's literally minute by minute, day by day that this is changing. So I appreciate all your sharing. But for the people that might watch this afterwards, just from a general standpoint, if somebody called you and they didn't know you, what are some of the questions that you take people through to determine whether there's potential for them that they can refinance or what their options are with mortgage. Like what questions do you ask people when they call you and who wants to take that one first? 
Well, I, I usually try to get a copy of their mortgage statement. Um, okay. That is hugely helpful. It gives us a lot of information to start the kind of research on what makes sense because it gives you um, what they owe, their interest rate, their principal and interest payment. And then usually most of them have the maturity date because that's important, right? You're going to be starting over a 30 year mortgage, let's say, and maybe they're already 10 years into the mortgage they have. And you have to factor that into your calculations because you're going to be adding potentially 10 more years to their payments. So I like to, if, if that were a scenario, uh, look at maybe a 15 year fixed or a 20 year fixed or give them the 30 year fix so they can have the option of the lower payment, but talk about maybe they want to make extra payments of what that would look like. Um, and so I start with the mortgage statement if I can, otherwise um, I'll just ask the questions over the phone, the, those same questions. And then the, the value, what they think the value of their home is, is important. Um, and if we're you know concerned about qualifying, then I'll go through the income part of the equation. Okay, great. John, how about you? Yeah, I had an interesting scenario and this one just, you know, we, we come up with creative solutions once the situation's in front of us. Now I have clients right now that have limited income, although it's pretty solid, it's there. And when I looked at their scenario, they have a first trustee on their home and an equity line of credit. And at first they just said, well, we just want to lower our mortgage payment. But then I looked at their debt as well. And quite frankly, you know, very straightforward asked, do you really anticipate ever paying off the entire balance on your mortgage in your lifetime? Now, mind you, I'm dealing with a husband that's uh, 61, a wife that is 58, 59 years old. And the answer was pretty frankly, no, we don't think we'll ever fully pay off the house. I said, okay, so this is about quality of life and cash flow. And with diminished income from Endeavor, my client is a pastor and they have a school that generates income. Well, that school is now closed. So their congregation is now suffering financially and their revenue just kind of drained away. So I looked at their entire debt and I looked at their current mortgages and by saying, look, at if you dip into the pockets of the equity of your home and pay off all of your debt your monthly obligation dropped, I kid you not, $2,000 a month. Oh my gosh. That got their attention. So now all of a sudden they have a payment that's uh, considerably lower than their total cash flow. It's a payment that they can manage if they choose to apply extra tort and pay it off sooner, they could. Uh, and I just did the equation. So you have to be creative about it. I did the math and said, look, if you just apply half of your savings towards the principal balance, you'll still pay this loan off in the same time frame that you're on track to do right now. So thinking outside the box and the reality of, am I ever gonna really pay it off? I took it one step further and said, by the way, when you both get to be in your early 60s, you're both there uh, and you don't have any children, you have a legacy to leave to your house, then you might convert that mortgage into a reverse mortgage and eliminate payments for the rest of your life. So wow. be creative uh, with how you're going to look at the income and debt and cash flow. Mm -hmm. I don't, That's you know, a good I, point. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, John, be bringing up the reverse mortgage. I was just thinking about that too. Um, I know a lot of our members may not be to the age of getting a reverse mortgage, but their parents might be. And, um, uh. If you want your parents <laughs> to not be maybe have to move to a you know home health care or a facility, a reverse mortgage is a wonderful way in which to keep your elderly parents in their home um, and with the amount of savings of not having a mortgage payment or if they have enough equity to be able to even pull income out of it, you can then bring someone in to assist them when it got to that point. Wow. You know, I, I have a question if I could jump in go here. Pat, go um, Patty. Some of, how, how do some of these restrictions or opportunities, if you will, um, change if you have a VA mortgage? Are they also, can you refinance those? Can you pull money out? I'm sorry, I didn't, if you have what kind of mortgage? A VA. Oh. 
Yeah, you can pull cash out on a VA mm -hmm. uh, mortgage if you have the uh, the equity, of course. Um, uh, John, do you want to say anything about VA? I know you do a lot. Yeah, of I do, because um, I have three VA loans uh, going now in various stages of them right now. One is a purchase, which uh, hopefully, knock on wood, will we'll keep glued together because both of my borrowers are um, disabled veterans, so that income stream is never going to change. Yeah. But if you have a current VA loan and you meet certain criteria, there's a tool called an IRRRL, an Interest Rate Reduction Refinance Loan. That's indigenous to VA. Hmm. It's a, a streamlined process where if it's all about just dropping the mortgage payment lower than your current interest rate, you can do so with very, very minimal documentation and then the income issue becomes a moot point because you don't have to verify you don't even write the income on the uh, loan application the the logic being if you've been good and made your mortgage payment all this time on the current VA loan you're most likely going to continue doing so and if all we're doing is dropping your rate lowering your payment the likelihood of you continuing to do so is really high mm -hmm. so if you VA loan, you might want to look into that interest rate reduction refinance loan that it's uh, indigenous to VA loans. Cool. Good. Thank you. You know, I, this is what I love is, you know, I, I know that we, I could ask you guys and have you share so much about mortgages and lending, but what's so valuable, I think, for so many of our members is these scenarios of the creative side of things. Because, John, you've shared that with me so much and being one of our partners and sponsors. For CWI and I'm curious what both of you you know what would if you if you could tell somebody that's on the fence of whether to call you or not call you and if they're in the situation right now that they're in there's so many different scenarios what do you wish people would do that they're not doing in relation to their mortgages because and let me finish with this what's interesting to me and what each of you are sharing is that you know we're always told that we should have a good banker that we surround ourselves with, a good attorney, we should have a good CPA. And it's like, to me, there should be a good mortgage lender that you kind of trust and have. I've never heard anybody say that, but the stuff that you're saying is your mortgage, there's different facets of your life journey that you need a good, you know, kind of advocate for you with your mortgage, because that's usually our biggest expense. So talk to me about that of what you wish people would do in relation to their mortgage over time that they're not doing. Of course, call you, but beyond that, like what do you wish people would do? It's a really key piece that I don't think people talk enough about. You pretty much sum, summed it up because yeah, it's your biggest debt in your lifetime. So you have to manage it, you know, with the same importance of any other aspect. And so, I mean, I don't really look at myself as a, just a, a mortgage a loan officer you know, we're an advisor of, you know, the overall debt picture and your real estate is a key component to your wealth. I, and I have to comment, I know Rebecca has considerable expertise in tax preparation and or tax planning. So it, we take it both to a different level. I have a very unique expertise with regards to um, inherited properties, dealing with a lot of estate planning attorneys. One of my biggest referral source is exactly those. So it's a family situation. Somebody inherited a property or, you know, you want to buy mom and dad's house from them or, you know, all those different uh, things people don't run across in everyday life. And as you said, when we started the show, people don't know what they don't know. And I'm being a little facetious here, but Michelle, when you ask, what do you want people to do? Um, tongue in cheek, I want them to do what I tell them to. <laughs> if indeed I say, hey, I need you to do A, B, and C, and D, yeah. uh, do so. It's helpful. Don't tie our hands behind our back when we're trying to help you. Help us help you. And you don't have to take our, our advice, but in a second opinion, we're fine to give it, and we're certainly there to help along the way. Cooperate, I think that's the biggest issue. I've almost, when you said that, John, I went back to the Jerry Maguire movie, right? The one where it was like, help me help you and, it's like, and you'll show them the money. I mean, that's how that goes. I love that. You know, I, I know we're almost out of time, but I was curious for both of you, you know, in this scenario, um, 
is there something I haven't asked you that you feel is timely or that you'd like to kind of share with anybody that might watch this or listen to this? Um, again, day to day, things change, but any final thoughts that you'd like to share other than do what John says and Rebecca, <laughs> you know, for you, it's like, it's like ask, you know, be, feel free to call you with questions, I think is what we're hoping people do. Yeah, call or community. even, even email. I mean, uh, some people don't want to pick up the phone for whatever reason initially. So I, you know, communicate a lot of times via email. Um, but I think being proactive versus reactive right now is important because if you are scrambling after the fact, after you lost your job or lost income, it's, it's going to be a little hard for us to help you at that point. Um, yeah. So if you're even on the fence about um, looking at maybe pulling equity out, you're going to want to do it, you know, while you have uh, your job in the state that it's in right now. Well, you know, and that, that, uh, that was great. I love that. You know, the other thing that comes up to all the time, you know, when we're talking about it, it with, with mortgages seems to be the fees that are involved and people go, Oh, it's going to be too costly. But, you know, I want, can you address that? Because in my mind, you know, that yes, there's fees associated with doing this, but when do the fees, you know, really cost justify going through and refinancing? I mean, very, very good question. Yeah. And that's something that um, I, we look at when we're evaluating. If somebody just wants to refinance to lower their rate and lower their payment, then it's a kind of a simple equation of, you know, how much did it cost versus how much are you saving and how long is it going to take you to recoup those costs? And usually if it's under two years and you're going to keep this mortgage long term, um, well, you know, longer, usually most people keep their mortgages five to seven years. So maybe even less mm -hmm. nowadays. So uh, if you can recoup it in a short period of time, then it would make sense. But once you start to factor in paying off debt, that kind of, that goes out the window because very quickly do you recoup the cost in what you're saving in interest and um, cash flow per month. Got it. You know, this is my yeah. final, oh, go ahead, John. So I, I echo 100% what Rebecca said there. I totally agree with that too. One of the other things I thought of yesterday is that uh, not only just the mortgage companies, your team, but of course, we're providers as well. And I can't tell you uh, how important it is and I know Rebecca does that. We have trusted service providers, title companies, escrow companies that are all working uh, at the same feverish pace we are. And I wrote a memo to the owners of the escrow company I used and the head of the title company locally and just, you know, telling them what a fantastic job their people are doing. All under the same strain that we are all working from home. And yet they didn't miss a, a hitch in the swing at all. So having our team behind us, it's not just us, but all the other people that are doing a bang up job right now. That's pretty positive. God, you just, you're Mr. Positivity. I love it. You know, this was kind of one other one that I wanted to talk about a little bit. And that is, you know, for so many, and, and women, that's our audience, is, and men, the whole thing about mortgages is, is like money and finances. It's such a personal thing. And I find through the conversations I've had with some of our members, they're like, oh, I don't want anybody to know my situation. You know, they're like, who? And, and mm -hmm. it's that wall that people won't just call and go, lest am I going to be judged? And I really want you to address that because I know we've talked about it, John, and I'm just like, you know what? You guys are like Vegas, man. What people talk about with you stays there. But tell me a little bit about that because I think that's one of the reasons Ab people don't call you. I mean, not only is it, you know, professional to keep everything confidential, and that's just how that is, um, but we, I, I can't speak for John, but, you know, I see so many people's financials and documents um, that I kind of equate it to a gynecologist. Like, it all looks the same. Like, I'm just moving through it. I don't remember. Um, exactly. <laughs> that's uh, your scenario? Is that, oh, my God, a gynecologist. I'm like, <laughs> okay, let's go with that. We're on to the next one. I don't remember. I'll have clients call me back and say, well, do you, re I don't remember those details because I'm on to the next. I think that's Exactly. Great. And one of the things that I think is really important, we both carry licenses that quite frankly were not easy to obtain when the rules changed some years back with NMLS. Uh, we used to operate in the Department of Real Estate and corporations. Well, now 
we're under a national licensing system. And by the way, by definition, we are both fiduciaries, which means we have to answer to a higher level of confidentiality than most people do in their jobs. So we are bound by law to keep everything confidential and to do more on behalf of the client to their uh, betterment than to even remotely think about our own you know, income coming from a situation. It's not income driven, it's need driven, and that is how we've both built very long-term successful careers. Yeah, that. absolutely. It's about, it's about servicing the client and what is best for the client. And, you know, conceptually, we all know that, but I think that's one of the things it's like people want to know that, you know, not, it, it, of course, we know that, but I wanted you, you two to say that because I know that's one of the things I've shared in some of the conversations I've had. It's like, just pick up the phone and call, you know, and, and say, this is going to be confidential. I just want to run this by you because, you know, that's why you two do what you do. And for our members, it's like, I don't want to know all the answers on mortgages and lending. What I want to know is do I have a source to be able to go there? So I thank both of you. Is there anything I've missed that you want to share about today and what's news today on mortgages and refinancing? Anything I've missed? You've done a bang up job. Woohoo! Well, that's what I go for, man. Good stuff. I can't think of anything else, but I'm really delighted you asked us on and I'm proud to be a part of the process. I love it. And if you're open to it, we'll do more. So Patty, any final questions and then we'll wrap up. No? No, this has been great. I mean, oh my things gosh. that we didn't even think about. So yeah. Yeah. So stuff. thank both of you. I want to thank both of you, our leading lady and our leading man today. Right. But um, uh, being our subject matter experts, I'm going to read my conclusion here, but you know, we're here so much more now with our Women Lead Online Forums. And to any of you that are watching this, if there's a topic you think we should be offering, we want to do that. It's like right now, it is a definitely uncertain, changing time. So again, John and Rebecca, thank you. And to all of our like audience and people that will watch this, we'll make sure we have a link to the um, discount link for Finance of America that will lead people um, to both of you, unless you would like any other way, John or Rebecca, that you want people to contact you. Um, and then we'll wrap up. Any phone, email? Just hit the link. Phone or email. What's your phone? What's your email, Rebecca? Oh, uh, sorry. I thought I was going to be on the screen. 808-250-6482. And my email is Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, at EliteLendingTeam.net. Awesome. John, how about you? My direct phone number is 760 area code 944-6555. And my email is simple, John B, J-O-H-N-B, at financeofamerica.com. Nice. I think, thank you. We are done for today's Women Lead Online Forum. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We good, Patty?